there, I'm Diana and you're watching Physics Girl. Last week, NASA made this big announcement about a new planetary system we found with a star called TRAPPIST-1 that has seven Earth-like planets. Ah! It's 39 light years away, but that would still take some millions of years to get to with current technology. So. Tough luck on visiting it. But there are still some crazy things about this system. The planets are all way closer to their star than even Mercury is to our sun. There's a possibility some of them are habitable, and the telescope that found them and the star are both named after a Belgian beer. <laughs> Good stuff. I got to interview one of the scientists on the team, who was also my first freshman physics professor at MIT. And I had a quick Skype chat with another scientist on the team. I asked them all about this discovery. Is it, is it exciting? I don't know, is it? Uh, well, it's sort of okay. No, it's super <laughs> exciting, of course it's exciting. It's an amazing, like, discovery. And Trappist was trending on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was super exciting. I kept getting, uh, like, messages from my friends during the day being like, oh, it showed up here, it showed up here. You know, I would get in the car with, like, the Uber driver and, like, they'd be, you know, be like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, did you hear about these planets? And they're like, oh, yeah, it's the most amazing thing. It's like, I was one of the discoverers. And they're like, can I get your picture? <laughs> <laughs> you are Uber driver famous. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Like you, once you hit that level. I'm not. Uh, the most important question, what have we discovered? So we found seven Earth-sized planets around a nearby star. And the seven planets are a space pretty evenly away from the star. And three of them are kind of right in the middle where we think that water could possibly exist on their surfaces. So we actually wrote a paper last year mm -hmm. reporting the discovery of three planets around the system. Right. And then um, in December of 2015, uh, one of my colleagues got a transit with the very large telescope in Chile. Mm -hmm. And uh, the transit was really bonkers. So usually when we see a transit, we kind of see like a little dip and then kind of comes back up and mm -hmm. it's very normal. This was like this kind of wonky up and down. And it, it initially we just thought, oh, something like just wrong with our calibration or data yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But one of our uh, teammates kind of realized that is that this was actually the transit of multiple planets passing in front of the star. Mm. And at the time, uh, we didn't had actually found those three planets yet. <laughs> right. so, so we were like, wow, something is, so there's, there's some there's other stuff going on here yeah what, one thing that I've heard and I'm like but I have heard a lot um, that people are like <laughs> we've discovered so many exoplanets lately like mm -hmm. what is so exciting about this particular system so a few things so obviously the fact that they're all earth size is very new right so up to this point most of the planets we find kind of from our various techniques have usually been big gas giants but of course we've never seen this many planets around another star and we've definitely never seen this many earth-sized planets around another star i mean not even around our star mm -hmm. right we've got four that's it so this is already beats that to, to spades one of the big questions we're trying to ask all of us sort of in astronomy is are we alone in the universe like how did we get here is life unique to this planet like what does it all mean and then this is like does it mean more right yeah <laughs> is life elsewhere in the universe and um you know, one of the things we know in terms of ingredients for life on this planet is the fact that it has liquid water, right? Nowhere else in the solar system, as far as we know, has liquid water on its surface today. Mm -hmm. We've found lots of planets that are huge planets, Jupiter-sized planets. Those are probably just big gas balls and not great places to stand around. And mm -hmm. so that's why the sizes are important. And then, of course, the distances are important because they tell us how much heat they're getting from their star and whether they have liquid water on them. You know, in the same way that people study galaxies or stars, planets are these, and planetary systems are these very interesting dynamical systems. And we want to know, just like we want to know how galaxies form and how the universe forms and how stars form, we want to know how planets form. And, you know, we can look at all the different types of stars and understand something about their evolution. And I, for me, it was very interesting just to think about planetary systems as sort of this new class of object. I don't know how answerable this question is. 42, so 42, 42, 42, 42, 42. <laughs> I want to ask about like, what it would potentially be like living on these planets, but mm. that's going to kind of depend on whether they're tidally locked. So the first thing we want to do is find out is there's an atmosphere. And we can do that because when, so the way we, I should go back, the way we found these planets is that they pass in front of their star mm -hmm. and they block out just a tiny, tiny little bit of light here. I even got a little demo. All oh, right. So, so here's sparkly little Trappist-1 blinking in its redness. And here's uh, one of the planets passing in front. Watch it carefully. That was very exciting. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> and it blocks about that much light, which is about 1% of the light from TRAPPIST-1. Mm -hmm. So it's a tiny little signal. So that's how we find the planet. Now, some of that light, if there's an atmosphere, also kind of filters around the planet and through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So molecules in the atmosphere will interact slightly differently with different colors of starlight. 
And so if you look at the light coming through the atmosphere when the planet's in transit, um, you can start to probe what molecules are in the atmosphere. I'm surprised that this is possible because... <laughs> Why? <laughs> because <laughs> you've got so much light coming from the sun, from the star. And then the amount of light that is going through the atmosphere is... Tiny. Uh, a tiny. Tiny. Like, when I did the planet passing around the star, that's a 1% effect. When we measure the light going through the atmosphere, it's like a parts per million measurement. Mm -hmm. So it's a tiny little signal. So the next step is really going to be be studying the makeup of the atmospheres using the absorption of light through the atmospheres. So that's going to be huge and really probably going to be done with JWST, which the James Webb Space Telescope, which actually hasn't launched yet. When does that launch? And then, uh, it'll be next year. I don't know exactly when, uh, um, but yeah, it's supposed to be next year sometime. That's so, really exciting. Yeah. What level are we at with our knowledge about the composition of these planets yet? We can say that we think that they're rocky with some atmosphere, or primarily rocky with atmosphere, but we're not at the point yet where we can say how much atmosphere there is. So there's two problems. One is that there's seven planets. So that pull is like back and forth in yeah. the crazy way. So the planets are interacting with each other as well. Yes. In this um, system, what's different is that the planets are near what's called mean motion resonances. So these are where, these are sort of special orbital locations where the period of two planets forms an integer ratio. It's like, um, it's like a, in a car when the one in front of you is, you know, maybe blinking twice every time yours blinks once and, or, you know, they meet up every once in a while. So one's going around twice every time one goes around. I can't do that. Yeah, yeah I know it's hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you're in configurations like that, you can end up where basically the small gravitational sort of kicks that the planet give each other, they end up sort of meeting each other at the right time in their orbit so that those kicks add up coherently. It'd be like if you're pushing someone on a swing, every time the person's back, that's when you push them. So your, your pushes add up and the person starts swinging more and more. That does not happen in our solar system. It does happen in our solar system with the moons of Jupiter, right? So mm -hmm. Jupiter's moons are very close together. So uh, what the result of that is that the Io is in this funny configuration where it gets kind of yanked into a slightly eccentric orbit mm -hmm. and then Jupiter tries to yank it back into a circular orbit and Io gets yanked back and forth. Yeah, yeah. That yanking causes it to stretch and that stretching causes it to become volcanic. That It heats up from the inside. Wow. Yeah. These planets are also in pretty close resonance and that's why we see these time and, uh, transit time and variations. Man. Yeah. Planetary systems are complicated. <laughs> <laughs> How much okay. do we know about like what it would potentially be like to live on these planets? Uh, <laughs> I think this is a question for like science fiction writers that can chew on for many, many years. Uh, <laughs> or for curious Diana. <laughs> or curious Diana, yes. So one, so one factor is that they are so close to their sun or their star that they are probably tidally locked, just like the moon is tidally locked to the Earth. Um, and so that has a couple of interesting effects, right? So one is, what time is it? <laughs> That's exactly well. <laughs> the response you would have on one of these planets because nothing would change, right? You right, wouldn't have right. the sun rising and setting, it would just stay there, yeah. right? And if you're on the day side, you wouldn't even see the stars. I mean, there's many cycles in our bodies that are based on the cycles in the earth, right? We wake up and we fall asleep on cycles right. that are based on the day and, and night. Um, we have menstrual cycles that are tied to the moon. Maybe there's a moon, so that would be that would save you. You'd have if you have a moon, you kind of know what time it is, right? Now imagine you have a world that has no external triggers, you know, indicators of time passing. Yeah. Um, how does life evolve? To, to to fall into these cycles. Right. So actually, one so one cycle they will see is I'm that my brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the good thing about these planets being so close is that you can see them, right? So even if you don't have right. a moon, uh, you know, if you're standing on Trappist One C, um, you're going to see Trappist One B kind of swing around every day and a half, and so that gives you kind of a ah, it's it's Trappist One B o'clock, all right? So, yeah. And then, so these planets yeah. are really close together. Yeah. Like the I yeah. super close to their star. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you compare the size of this system to the size of Jupiter and its moons, which we talked about before, that's actually pretty close. We kind of talked about this already, like what we're what we're looking for next. So we're we're looking for um, an atmosphere yep. composition of the atmosphere. You can think about it as sort of a process of characterization, where from the transits we find the planets, we know what their periods are, and we learn about how big they are. More transits are going to help us measure masses, so then we get an idea, rough idea of composition, if they're rocky or not. 
Um, and then ultimately, though, we want to say, okay, what are the atmospheres made out of? And that's still to come. We're now starting the Speculus mm -hmm. survey. Uh, we chose uh, about 500 very low mass stars, all within the vicinity of the sun. And what we're going to do in this survey is actually image all of them with, and do the same kind of measurements for every one of these stars. And the goal is to actually answer the question, is this a unique system or is this actually quite common? That, I just am imagining like picking up a piece of dust with the tweezers off of your desk and being like, okay, yeah. I'm going to learn all about the outer layer of it by just like, you know, shining a flashlight from over there. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it though. Yeah, it's really cool. It's amazing we can say all this stuff, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Man, astrophysicists are the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out while I grilled these scientists with my curiosity. Let me know in the comments if there's something you're really excited about with regards to exoplanets. And happy physicsing! Mm -hmm.